Well, I want the story to come out. I want, I want the world to know what has happened to the kids here. The fact that uh, thousands upon thousands uh, uh, were, uh, were killed here. The, it was a holocaust for our, our kids. And then, uh, and then have to suffer now through the, the fact that uh, most of those little kids they killed off, nobody knows who they were, where they're buried, uh, went home. So I, I don't know how we're going to deal with that, but we have to deal with that. I'm here to tell about my sister, Victoria Kathleen Stewart, who was nine years old when she was killed in Edmonton Residential School. He was one of the big boys, so he had to pack bodies out, literally pack the bodies out of the dispensary where uh, experiments had been um, done on these, these kids. Most of them were very young. He said they were about 10 to 12 years old. Hello and welcome to the second session of the International Common Law Court of Justice convened under natural law and the law of nations. My name is Kevin Andy Eagle Strong Voice, and I am the chief advisor to the prosecutor's office of the court. Our court has convened once again to conclude the first case in our docket in the matter of intentional genocide by church and state in Canada and the guilt and liability for crimes against humanity on the part of the officers of the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church and the United Church of Canada as well as the Government of Canada and the Crown of England. Today we will complete our argument in this case. The opening session of our court convened on November 6, 2012, and we will continue today with this evidence of genocide in Canada by addressing the two final legal definitions of genocide, which are creating the long-term conditions for the destruction of a targeted group and forcibly removing people from one group to another. I urge our 58 citizen jurors and our panel of esteemed judges to refresh their memory of the complete evidence in this first case by reviewing our November 6th online posting at www.itccs.org in order to place what you will receive today in a complete context and understanding and to treat it as a single body of evidence. Let me add that for the record, none of the defendants save one has responded to our public summons issued to them as 32 fiduciary officers of these church and state corporations. These officers include Stephen Harper, Prime Minister of Canada, Elizabeth Windsor, so-called Queen of England, Joseph Ratzinger, so-called Pontiff of the Church of Rome, and other heads of various churches and corporations in Canada. Our prosecutor's office is therefore obliged to proceed with our case against these defendants, with the understanding that after the presentation of our case and our closing arguments, these defendants will have a third and final opportunity to present a case in their own defense before a final verdict is rendered. Now, before we proceed by addressing these two final aspects of the crime of genocide, I've been asked by our prosecutor's office to submit some new and extremely significant evidence that has been acquired since the posting of our opening arguments on November 6, 2012. This new evidence clearly proves that the enormous death rates in Canadian Indian residential schools were undeniably the result of an intentional plan by churches and the government to destroy Aboriginal children. I submit to the court exhibit documents numbered 73 through to 78, which are statistical records and correspondence from the Department of Indian Affairs located in the public archives in Ottawa, Canada. These documents clearly show that in the final years of the 19th century, the average death rate among Indians as a whole in the central prairie region of Canada was much lower than the death rate among Indian children in the same region once these children entered Indian schools, and that this enormous leap in mortality rates occurred practically the same year that the first Indian schools were opened. In other words, Deaths within these schools cannot be blamed on health conditions already existing among Indian nations, as the defendants have argued, nor did the enormous death rate develop over time, but was present at the very start of the Indian residential school system. Exhibit 73 
as a list of the death rate among Treaty Indians from Manitoba to Alberta in the year 1889, the same year that the first government-authorized and church-funded Indian schools opened in Western Canada. This Treaty Indian death rate was as low as 12.7 per 1,000, or 1.3 percent, among the Blackfeet Nation, to a high of 76.6 per 1,000, or 7.7 percent, among the moscow Patung band of the Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. The average death rate among all 19 of the separate tribes surveyed was therefore only about 4.8 percent. However, just two years later, in 1891, According to a report by Government Health Inspector Dr. George Orton, the average death rate among children from these very same Indian nations in the Western Indian schools was already over 30 percent, over six times higher than the general Indian death rate. Exhibit 74 is even more dramatic, showing how in the year 1896, eight out of 13 children had died at the Catholic Quapal Indian School in Saskatchewan, or about 70 percent of them a rate over 10 times higher than the general Indian death rate in the same period. Exhibit 75 indicates that exactly two-thirds of the children had died at the Regina Elkhorn School in the same year of 1896, barely three years after that Indian school had first opened. It must be noted that the statistics at hand indicate that this huge jump in death rates seems to have occurred predominantly in Western Indian residential schools, as Exhibit 76 reveals. This chart of the status of Indian children discharged from various schools across Canada shows that the average death rate among former internees in Ontario schools averaged only between 2 and 15 percent. But in the Western Indian schools, the mortality rate among school graduates in the same period varied from 25 percent in Brandon to 40 percent at Cooper Island on the West Coast to over 65 percent in Kootenay, British Columbia. This variation strengthens the argument of our prosecutor's office, namely that the Indian residential schools were used as deliberate killing machines by being situated in those regions most densely populated with unassimilated non-Christian Indians, which in the 1890s was mostly in the prairies and on the west coast of Canada. The fact that Western Indian schools were statistically more harmful and death-causing than those in the East at this time was clearly not because Western Indians were more diseased or unhealthy, but because the conditions in the Indian schools in the West had been structured to be deliberately lethal for the simple purpose of rapidly depopulating the Western territories to make room for white settlers after the completion of the National Can Canadian Pacific Railway in the year 1886, three years before the Western residential schools opened. Now, to summarize and illustrate this evidence, we have prepared these two charts. Chart A compares the Aboriginal death rate in general, column 1, with the death rate of children in Indian residential schools, column 2, in the year the Western schools opened, 1891. Chart B compares the Aboriginal death rate in Ontario Indian Residential Schools, Column 1, with the death rate in Western Indian Residential Schools, Column 2, in the year 1900. Now, in general, the immediate astronomical rise in mortality among Indians in Indian schools in the West after 1886 was due to conditions present at the commencement of the school system. And I want to emphasize that. These deadly conditions were present at the very commencement of the residential school system. Deadly conditions that were not widely present within Aboriginal communities. 
but were unique to the residential schools themselves. Disease-filled conditions, in the words of government inspector Dr. Peter Bryce in 1909, that were, in his words, quote, being deliberately created, unquote. Now we know exactly what these conditions were. Tuberculosis contagion and an unclean, underfed, and unhealthy environment where Indian children were deliberately imprisoned, brutalized, and never treated or helped. We must therefore conclude that these so-called Indian residential schools were established with a clear purpose, to make Indian children lethally sick, particularly in the schools of the Western Territories. This purpose is indicated as well by the official response to the reporting of this huge and sudden growth in the Indian death rate, which indicates a clear intent to conceal its mortality rate as Exhibit 77 and 78 reveal. Exhibit 77 is a letter from a Western Indian Commissioner in June 1903 to the Indian Affairs Superintendent in Ottawa. Now you'll note this letter refers to, quote, the undesirability of requiring the principals of the schools to continue from time to time, including on their returns, names of all dead children, unquote. The commissioner recommends instead, quote, entering in the return a statement showing simply the number returned as dead on the previous return, unquote. In other words, any record of the long-term murderous effect of the residential schools on its graduates was to be expunged from the official reports. Exhibit 78 is the response to the suggestion of censorship from Frank Pedley, who was superintendent of Indian Affairs in Ottawa. Pedley approves of the suggested change, stating that from then on, his department will, quote, drop the names of pupils who died previous to the year for which the return is made out, unquote. Clearly, the fact that enormous numbers of children kept dying after graduating from these facilities caused the government to officially conceal this continuing death rate by as early as the year 1903. Well, to summarize this first bit of evidence, the facts therefore speak plainly. One, Indian children began dying in much higher numbers out of proportion to normal Indian mortality as soon as they entered the Indian residential school system and this death rate remained constant over decades. Two, the conditions causing these deaths were present from the very beginning of the residential school system, most demonstrably in the Western Territories, where three quarters of the residential schools were located by the year 1920. Three, this enormous mortality was concentrated among most independent and unassimilated, that is, non-Christian Indian nations. Four, any statistical record of the broader long-term consequences of this huge mortality rate was officially censored from Canadian government reports after the year 1903. All of these facts clearly indicate an intentional purpose by the Canadian government and the operating churches to use Western Indian residential schools to kill off large numbers of Aboriginal children. Now, a survivor of two Western Indian residential schools, Peter Yellowquill, of the Anishinaabe Nation of Manitoba sums up what this murderous regime was like in practice in Video Exhibit 79. There's absolutely no reason for these places, none whatsoever except one thing, genocide. They should declare it a, 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 a national site of tragedy or something. They should declare this place, you know, a, a monument to, to, to the churches and, and Canada's uh, uh, spiritual adultery. And, 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 uh, to the genocide they committed. If, if there was ever a place, this should be it. In this light, we will now proceed with the next set of evidence concerning the other two genocidal acts found within the Indian residential school system. The fourth genocidal act of which the defendants are guilty is creating conditions to cause the long-term destruction of a targeted group including by forcing them off their land and stripping them of their livelihood, their resources, and their identity. This genocidal action is by far the most insidious and far-reaching, and has become, we will argue, 
a structural bedrock of Canadian society and its material prosperity. Essentially, the conditions have been deliberately created to ensure the long-term extermination of distinct Indigenous nations across Canada, as is evident in the continued high death rates and the extinguishing of languages and culture among existing Native nations. Now, this fourth genocidal action of causing the long-term destruction of targeted Indigenous nations has three main aspects. The first is stripping Indigenous people and nations of their culture, language, customs, and group identity. The second is destroying the family unit and normal relations between the sexes, siblings, and different generations among Indigenous people. And the third is robbing Native nations of their traditional lands and resources and making them permanent landless and stateless refugees in their own land in order to complete their final eradication. Our office will document how these aims have been achieved not only within the Indian residential school system, but across all of Canada, wherever European Christian capitalist culture has impacted Aboriginal people. The Indian residential school system existed with a distinct purpose, to exterminate every aspect of distinct Indigenous languages and cultures. Every child incarcerated in an Indian residential school was routinely forced to speak English without exception and punished severely for speaking their native tongue. This was a structural feature of these schools and not a random one. Exhibit 80 is a letter from a young native boy incarcerated in the Presbyterian Indian School in a house at British Columbia in 1910. In it, he states, We're not also to speak in our Indian language for if we do, we are to stay in school on Saturdays. Punishment inflicted on Indian children for speaking their own language was often much more severe. In Exhibit 81, Willie Sport describes in a sworn statement his ordeal at the Port Alberni United Church Residential School when he writes, quote, Another time, I spoke Indian in front of Reverend Pitts, the principal of the Alberni School. He said, were you speaking Indian? Before I could answer, he pulled down my pants and whipped my behind until he got tired. When I moved, he put my head between his knees and hit me harder. He used a thick conveyor belt from a machine to whip me. Other West Coast survivors like Vera Hunt and Dennis Tellio describe being made to beat other children for speaking Indian as they came to run down a gauntlet of other students. Children died as a result of these beatings, according to Vera Hunt. Now in a video exhibits 82 and 83, Joan Morris and Martha Joseph, both former prisoners in West Coast Indian schools, described how they lost not only their langu language, but their identity as Indigenous people. I lost my language too. I can understand it, but I can't speak it either. And I cry too. I lost my culture. I have survived Cape Island. I have survived Nile and in hospital. My mom. I never had a mom. She went in when I was two weeks old. She came out when I was 15 years old. Our people were, uh, were punished just for speaking our language. And all our artwork was taken away because we thought we're a cult. We're a cultic people. And when the lines were drawn on the land, on the land like you're living here today, if one of our First Nations people were caught off the reserve, Back in the early 1900s, they were caught three miles off the reserve. They were charged by the authorities. You had to have permission to, to leave the reserve from the Indian Department. And they had a book stamp. The language of a people is their soul. And as oral cultures, all of the laws, the history, and economic life of Native people in Canada were traditionally contained in their languages. Once the language is gone, so is every one of these foundations of culture. And so the legal banning of Indian languages was central to the plan by church and state for the destruction of native nations. 
That banning was first enshrined across Canada in the federal law in the Indian Act of 1927, the same year that Indians were denied the right to hire a lawyer or go to court or convey land debt transactions. And just prior to the passing of the first sexual sterilization laws aimed at Indians. And yet the prohibition of native culture in the still largely Aboriginal Western territories of Canada had become long before that, in the year 1885, when the first law banning potlatching and other ancient customs was passed in the British Columbia Legislature, Exhibit 84. This law was in effect until 1953, and under it, countless Native elders were imprisoned for practicing their customs. Now, it's clear from the evidence that the Christian churches led this assault on Indigenous culture. Exhibit 85 is a letter dated November 1909 from the Women's Auxiliary of the Anglican Church's Missionary Society, addressed to the Superintendent of Indian Affairs in Ottawa. It describes, quote, the great evils with the marriage customs of the Indians, unquote, on Vancouver Island, and earnestly entreat the Dominion government to do all in its power to stamp out this terrible evil so that so destructive to the souls and bodies of our fellow countrymen, unquote. In fact, the prohibitive laws against podlatching, marriage, and other Aboriginal customs arose from much earlier church plans for eradicating non-Christian peoples in North America, one established by Jesuit-trained missionary and later Bishop Paul Durier of the Oblate Order. Exhibit 86 is a leaked internal document from the Oblate Order headquarters in Montreal. It describes the Durier plan in detail. The document states, quote, The Indians are only big children who can be naughty sometimes. Bishop Durier boldly created, as it were, an Indian state ruled by the Indian but under the directive authority of the bishop and the local priests as supervisors. The laws of the community were all the precepts of the church, and the laws of the state went in conformity with the laws of the church, unquote. The so-called Durier plan for a Catholic theocratic state imposed on Indians was what the Catholic Church called the doctrine of Catholic political action applied to pagan Indians, which was simply a plan to destroy the traditional tribal leadership and supplant it with Catholic-educated Indian chiefs loyal to the Church and then restructure native village life into a church-run dictatorship. This method was first applied by Durier against West Coast Indians during the 1850s and 60s and was so successful that it served as a model for the later Indian residential school system adopted by Protestant churches and the Government of Canada. Under the control of a priest, Catholic Indians in their villages were incited against their neighbors through their operation of a spying system known as the Watchmen. Natives who were deputized by the church to arrest any fellow Indian who spoke their language, seemed lazy, didn't attend Catholic Mass, or practice their traditional customs. These so-called criminals would then be tried in special church courts and imprisoned, publicly flogged, fined, or even banished forever from the village. This early system of Catholic dictatorship uprooted and destroyed the fabric of Native life through such divide-and-conquer methods and lay the basis for the Indian Residential School's genocide, for it was a system that was picked up and dutifully copied, as mentioned, by Protestant churches and governments in Canada and the United States. The subjugation of Indians perfected by Bishop Durier became enshrined as Canadian law in 1874 with the passing of the Federal Indian Act of Canada, a law establishing legal and social apartheid against Indian, Indians that is still in effect, contrary to international law. The Indian Act and the Catholic segregationist philosophy behind it created two definitions of Indians in Canada, which is still the law, so-called status and non-status Indians. 
as well two permanently different standards of education, law and health for whites and Indians was established in Canada by this act and subsequent laws, reflected in successive actions by church and state whose murderous practice against Indians could be legally sanctioned and justified. For example, in the year 1919, when the death rate among children in Indian residential schools climbed dramatically because of a standard practice of contaminating healthy children by making them be in contact with the sick, the federal government abolished all medical inspection in these schools after pressure was exerted by the churches to do so. Let me emphasize that. Federal medical inspection of Indian residential schools was officially abolished in 1919. This abandonment of all duty of care towards sick children in the residential schools was brought in by a Crown Order in Council, that is, not through the Parliament of Canada, but secret order in Council, and it resulted in an immediate rise in deaths from tuberculosis among Indians, as Exhibit 87 indicates. This intentional abrogation of all responsibility for the care of Indians by the Crown of England and Canadian government was a deliberate criminal act. And yet this crime was camouflaged by the government the following year, when Interior Minister Arthur Meehan openly lied in the House of Commons by stating that the death rate from tuberculosis was not increasing among Indians. Between 1919 and 1920, Deaths from tuberculosis among Indians in Canada more than tripled, according to the government's own published records. But according to Exhibit 88, on June 8, 1920, when asked by a member of Parliament whether tuberculosis was increasing among Indians, Arthur Meehan stated, quote, We are not convinced that it is increasing, but it is not decreasing. Exhibit 88. The hard evidence that this plan of extermination was fostered at the highest level of church and state power is found in the next two documents, Exhibits 89 and 90. Exhibit 89 is a copy of the Master Agreement establishing church and state co-administration of all Indian schools across Canada. Dated November 25, 1910, this contract was ratified by the Department of Indian Affairs and 27 officials of the Roman Catholic, Anglican, Presbyterian, and Methodist churches, the latter two churches being the predecessor to the United Church of Canada. You'll note on page 2, the contract states that the two primary purposes of residential schools is, quote, to give the pupils religious instruction at proper times, to instruct the male pupils in gardening, farming, and care of stock, and the female pupils in cooking, laundry work, and general housewifery and dairy work." Unquote. In short, the aim was not to educate, but to create a class of untutored, religiously indoctrinated slave laborers. Exhibit 90 reveals a similar statement that was issued 16 years later at the National General Council meeting of the United Church of Canada, formed by an act of Parliament and by the Union of the Presbyterians and Methodists the previous year. The United Church policy statement governing Indian work reads, quote, In our residential schools, we are trying to give the Indian boy and girl instruction that is practical and such as will prepare them to be successful farmers. No occupation will so soon dispossess him of his nomadic instincts and fix upon him a permanency of habitation as gardening, care of stock, and farming. Many of our graduates surrender their treaty rights and become naturalized, and for them and their children, the Indian problem is forever solved, since it is the Indian massed in tribes and kept on reserves which creates the problem. Exhibit 90.
Now, a more concise description of an intent to commit cultural genocide on a people has rarely been made. Finally, it is important to note that this clear genocidal aim was facilitated by the fact that traditional ind indigenous governments were destroyed by Euro-Canadian culture and replaced with puppet Aboriginal band councils controlled by the government that still administer the official native world today. In 1914, Amendments to the Federal Indian Act prohibited all native political bodies except a state-appointed band council that was chaired and controlled by the local white Indian agent. Exhibit 91 is a copy of minutes of the Squamish Indian Council on the West Coast, dated September 31, 1939. The chairman of the council, you will note, is F.J.C. Ball, the Indian agent. And to show how this political dependency continues today, Canada's Indian Act still allows the Minister of Indian Affairs to remove any elected band council on Indian reservations anywhere in Canada, to nullify their votes, and to even determine the wills and bequests of any Aboriginal person on reservation, Exhibit 92. This permanent dehumanization and destruction of all aspects of Aboriginal life was made all the more effective by aiming itself at the very heart of Indigenous communities by destroying the very fabric of family life and relationships. Now we're going to continue with the second aspect of the long-term destruction of Native nations, destroying family unity and normal relations between the sexes and different generations, and how this was evident throughout the entire Indian residential school system. Peter Yellowquill is a hereditary elder of the Ojibwe Anishinaabe Nation in Manitoba, and he was imprisoned in two United Church residential schools in the 1950s and 60s. He describes the destructive effect on his culture and family in video exhibit 93. And, and we took that poison home. But it was here, it was, it was we learned nothing here about uh, ethics, morals, or nothing. You learned absolutely nothing about your family. Nothing at all. Uh, the, 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 the discipline was corporal, and it was swift, and it was, it was terror. It, it created terror in your mind. And it bruised your body and bruised your spirit. We were little boys and little girls. Pierre Kruger is a survivor of two Catholic residential schools in central British Columbia. In video exhibit 94, he describes how he and other members of his family were encouraged to have sexual relations with one another and how residential school destroyed the wider family, all the result of actions of priests and others in the residential school system. As we got a little older, they made us uh, do a lot of things that uh, we didn't even understand uh, what we were doing. We were forced to do these things by our, our older kids or whatever, uncles, cousins that came back from residential school. We were forced to do these things uh, on uh, some of our own cousins and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and as we grew up older, you know, we thought that was normal. We didn't know that, uh, you know, what, uh, how to really make love or what sex was about. Because from what we were taught, uh, you know, turn them all over, they were, and they're all sisters. Uh, you know, a lot of us uh, haven't had a, didn't have a clue. And our parents, uh, most of our parents lost that uh, parenting skill when they went to residential school. So the teaching of uh, sex or whatever, there was nobody there to teach us what uh, 
sex and love was all about. So, you know, when you learn something when you're three, four, five, six, seven years old, you're forced to do something, you know, then as you get older, it becomes normal. Retired RCMP officer George Brown, a northern British Columbia Indian who was incarcerated in a United Church residential school at the age of six, describes in graphic detail the consequences on his own family and his life in Video Exhibit 95. You felt, uh, uh, what did I do wrong? What did I do to deserve to go to uh, such an establishment? Uh, it was not explained to me. Uh, right to this day, we still don't know why we went there. And uh, we were just herded off like cattle. And immediately uh, going onto the train, I learned that uh, we were separated from our family members and uh, we were not allowed to communicate with one another. And we got to the residential school, uh, we never did go to school. And we, never, we were never fed. We were always starving. And the mental abuse uh, was there, uh, the physical abuse. And they treated us like animals. Uh, they'd throw food at us. The early plan of the government to encourage this destruction of Aboriginal families and life is described in Exhibit 96 from a letter from Indian agent R. H. Pidcock to A. W. Vowell, British Columbia Indian Superintendent. The letter dated July 22, 1891. Now again, this is two years after the start of the Western Residential Schools. The letter states, quote, I know of nothing more likely to be of real benefit to the Indians of this agency than an industrial school after the plan of other industrial schools erected in the province, where the youth of both sexes might be taken permanently away from the influence of the present mode of life. Let me restate that. Where the youth of both, both sexes might be taken permanently away from the influence of their present mode of life." Unquote. So determined were Canadian church and state to separate Aboriginal relatives and siblings for each other that they regularly endangered the lives of Indian children in order to do so. In Exhibit 97, from a letter dated April 1936, West Coast Indian agent Gerald Berry recommends that padlocks be placed on all the fire escapes at the Anglican St. George's School in Lytton, British Columbia, locking in both boys and girls at night in order to prevent their commingling. Exhibit 98 is a letter dated September 1904 from a top Indian Affairs official affirming that it is the policy, quote, that no communication should exist between the boys and girls dormitories at the Ahousat Indian Residential School. The deliberate destruction of Aboriginal families is further attested in Exhibit 99. By this letter dated November 1910 from a West Coast Indian agent, Charles Perry, in which he states that, quote, the annihilation of 80% of the village dogs will mean a much better moral future for the Port Simpson Indians, unquote. Perry believed that the presence of dogs was having a destructive moral effect on Aboriginal children. Therefore, most of their pets should be shot. Native children were routinely forced to watch the torture, rape, and humiliation of their brothers and sisters at the hands of staff and clergy in residential schools. Lillian Shirt of the Cree Nation in Alberta. And then Jenny was tied like this, bare butt, to the post. And she had her, had her belly on the bed. And the priest took my shoulders, put my head up like this, look. And then I wouldn't look, I just closed my eyes. And then Jenny's, Jenny wouldn't cry out, and then all of a sudden, this blood just spurred all over the place. And on her, it was on her back, and a small part of her back here. 
Did it open up? It opened up wide. And the blood came. <laughs> oh God. This is the last time I ever saw my sister. Such outright terrorizing of Aboriginal families was a structural feature of the Indian residential school system. It was not simply the result of random terror by individuals. The reduction of children to sex objects for bartering in well-protected child trafficking networks was a structural feature of the Indian residential schools and ensured the long-term destruction of Aboriginal families, as did outright torture of the children. Wilf Price of the Haida Nation describes some of this in video exhibit 101. At night, my father could hear, my father could hear uh, other children being taken out of bed by, uh, by, by uh, a couple of the ministers. They were taken out of the, uh, they were taken from their beds. It was a, it's an open dorm, and they were taken out of their beds, and he could hear them crying and and saying things like, "Don't." Don't put it in there. Don't put it in there. It's hurting. Um, he never witnessed it, but he knew what was happening because these kids would come back and uh, he'd have to get up because he was the oldest. He'd have to get up and he would be putting coal packs, uh, cold and wet packs on their, uh, their, um, their bloodied uh, rectums from the, from the abuse that they were taking. Peter Yellowquill of the Ojibwe Nation in Manitoba observed the same targeting of children by sexual predators who worked at United Church residential schools he attended in Brandon and Portage La Prairie. Video exhibit 102. This was like a, walking into a concentration camp, the only way I can say it. And, and like we see in, the, in Auschwitz and those types of films, someone was there, it's like you go to the left or to the right. And, and when you were going by, you were already being selected by someone for for some form of sexual abuse, and the, uh, the pedophiles would, 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 would come to the showers and they would select their victims. And this was constant year after year after year after year, probably since they first built, first built this place. He was an alcoholic priest or who wanted to have a little sex with me, it was very hard on me. So. I guess he passed on this message to the nun, the one that was taking care of me. And she started telling me that she, they had to do this anal tests, like shove things up there, plug me in. Yeah. Up your penis. Yeah. They started using broom, um, plunger handles, you know, doing it. And then it was always very painful. And I didn't know that they were preparing me for the, this priests and brothers. The practice of deliberately dumbing down Native children and denying them a proper education was another structural feature of Indian residential schools in Canada and guaranteed the further destruction of Aboriginal communities. As we documented in our first round of evidence in November, particularly intelligent Native children were subjected to involuntary sexual sterilization at residential schools and Indian hospitals as a normal practice. Within the residential schools as well, it was a policy to prohibit especially smart Native children from carrying on and securing a normal public school or higher education. Exhibit 103 is a letter dated August 1934 from West Coast Indian agent Edward Frost, addressed to the Secretary of Indian Affairs in Ottawa. It recommends that funding be denied for five Alberni residential school students who wanted to attend the local public high school to achieve their diplomas. Frost states, quote, these pupils appear to be above the ordinary run of intelligence, but I fail to see where a high school training is going to benefit them. I'm not making these remarks as pertaining, pertaining to the above mentioned pupils only, but I consider they apply generally to Indian pupils, unquote. No funding was provided for any of these five boys.
Finally, the classically effective method of divide and conquer was utilized in the Indian residential schools to pit Aboriginal families against one another, including by paying puppet chiefs to kidnap and transport children in their own communities into the residential schools or to track them down when they escape from there. Exhibits 104 and 105 are receipts issued by the Indian Affairs Departments and a local taxi company in Duncan, British Columbia, in February 1940. Both of them in indicate payments made to Cowichan Band Council Chief Fred Thorne for transporting children to the Catholic Cooper Island Residential School and for locating and returning two truant pupils to the same residential school. In this way, the targeting of Aboriginal family and tribal loyalty for destruction was a normal operating feature of the Indian residential school system. Now, the third aspect of the long-term destruction of Native people in Canada involves robbing Native people of their lands and resources and reducing them to stateless and landless refugees in their own country in order to complete that final eradication. This crime is probably one of the easiest to demonstrate since the displacement of Native people from their lands and resources has been a cornerstone feature of Canadian society from its very inception. Suffice it to say that today, on average, Aboriginal groups in Canada retain less than 1% of their original land base. Now, the foundational beliefs and laws responsible for the European theft of Aboriginal lands are described in detail in our accompanying work, Hidden No Longer, Genocide in Canada, Past and Present, which you can access at www.hiddennolonger.com. These beliefs are over 15 centuries old and emerge from European Christendom and specifically the customary law based on the Roman imperial tradition known in Latin as terra nullius, meaning the land of no one. And to give some background, this law and 15th century papal bulls known as Romantus Pontifex and Intercatera declared that non-Catholic populations were not human and therefore did not own or control their own lands or even their own souls. The Pope in Rome, under his own laws and ways of thinking, had the right to grant any such people's land to whoever, whoever he chose. This basic notion that indigenous people do not possess sovereign authority over themselves or their land has never altered and continues to operate today in Canada as under any colonial system derived from European Christendom. A simple glance at the preamble to the Indian Act of Canada reveals how Euro-Christian appropriation of Aboriginal lands is ingrained in Canadian law, custom, and thinking. Exhibit 106 is the latest revised version of the Federal Indian Act, which describes natives as, quote, a body of Indians for whose use and benefit in common lands, the legal title to which is vested in Her Majesty, have been set apart, unquote. Now, Black's Law Dictionary defines vested rights as those having an absolute right or title so completely and definitely in a person that they are not subject to defeat or cancellation by another. In other words, the absolute and unchallengeable title and ownership of land in Canada resides in one authority, the Crown of England, which under Canadian law alone exercises sovereignty over native land and territories. This act of nullification of entire nations is at the heart and is the cause of all subsequent land theft and displacement of indigenous people in Canada as in America. So Canada's sold off all our, our lands, they've sold off our resources, never discussed it with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anything, uh, this is probably one of the reasons why they moved Indians onto these uh, concentration camps called reserves, but today they, they're they probably upgraded to a new status of uh, ghettos, and that's what they are today. They've used this most racist piece of legislation called the Indian Act to control the whole economic setting for First Nations people. The copying the papal practice of distributing other people's lands to various invaders 
the Crown of England established a system known as clergy reserves by the early 19th century, even before Canada proper came into being. Under a practice of land grabbing, later called preemption, the Crown granted hundreds of acres of land to any missionary of the Church of England or the Roman Catholic Church once that missionary established himself in an Indian territory. Acquiring these vast areas of resource-rich lands became a prime motive for Christian missionary work among Indian nations and for the latter establishment of Indian residential schools on these lands, especially in Western Canada. Exhibit 107, for example, indicates the location of Indian residential schools in British Columbia in the year 1920. Every one of these schools was located on or close to the prosperous local fishing grounds or timber stands occupied by the Indian nation whose children were incarcerated in the local residential school. These lands were acquired by the first church missionaries under the general legal right of clergy preemption granted by the Crown, but also through outright murder and conquest. Exhibit 108. In 1864, this man, Church of England missionary John Sheepshanks, disseminated smallpox through forcible inoculations among the Chilcotin Indians of central British Columbia. Over 90% of the Chilcotins then died within a few months, and their land was immediately acquired by a group of shareholders that included Reverend John Sheepshanks, who were all part of the Hudson's Bay Company affiliate known as the Puget Sound Land Company. This company had preempted the Chilcotin land the week before Sheepshanks had begun his deadly inoculation there of the Chilcotins. For his wiping out of most of the Chilcotins in the interest of his business partners, Reverend Sheepshanks was rewarded not only by his fellow shareholders, but by the Crown of England, which soon after made him the Bishop of Norwich and awarded him a permanent seat in the British House of Lords that he occupied until the year 1909. Now, the Indian residential schools played a central role in this enormous land grab and were usually situated on or near very wealthy resources desired by whites. When the operation of the residential schools interfered with the whites' hunger for native land or resources, those schools were moved. In this letter from Indian Affairs Superintendent Duncan Campbell Scott, dated May 1919, he writes to a Presbyterian church official that the pro proposed location of the church's Alberni residential school is considered, quote, detrimental to the town, and that the presence of the school will attract the Indians to the reserve in the vicinity of Alberni, thus tending to perpetuate the Indian holdings, which the town people hope will soon be open for settlement, unquote. The site of the residential school was then moved. Exhibit 109. The clergyman principals of these schools were usually conferred by the government with the power of magistrates, policemen, and land brokers and thereby could preempt any native land or arrest, sentence, and imprison any Indian. One such case involves Principal John Ross of the Presbyterian and later United Church and the Ahousa Residential School that had ran on Vancouver Island. As this letter dated November 1914 from an Ahousa chief describes, Principal John Ross personally arrested Ahousa elders who practiced their potlatching or who refused to bring their children into the residential school set up by him in the village. Ross operated a private police force using native constables, and with that power forced the houses to surrender to him most of the valuable land in their community for only $104, about 100 acres of prime forested land, or about a dollar an acre. Exhibit 110. Now, Exhibit 111 shows that, at the time, this parcel of land in Marktosa's village was actually worth over $15 an acre, not a dollar, according to the government's own figure. So after robbing the houses of their land for about 7% of its true value, 
The Presbyterian Church then tried to sell off the same stolen land to the government for $8,000 or $80 a hectare, 80 times the amount they had paid to the Hausad Indians. Exhibit 111. This kind of land profiteering and speculation eventually profited the heirs to the Presbyterian Church, the United Church of Canada, and its corporate partners. In 1994, the United Church sold off the remaining stolen a house of land in a marktosis at a bargain to its corporate funders, Macmillan Bloedel and Normus Logging Company, and not a penny of that money ever returned to the Ahousa people. This continued exploitation of indigenous land by modern-day churches and their corporate benefactors is elaborated in a joint open letter by former United Church ministers Bruce Gunn and Kevin Annett in Exhibit 112. And this whole matter will be the subject of a separate case in the docket of our court later on. When they quarantined it, no one was allowed here. So they came to the longhouses and took all the ceremonial and the belongings of these, our families. And then after they've taken them, they came with the gunboats. And there were three longhouses here. And they were the family longhouse. And there was a community longhouse, a smokehouse. And the gunboats came and blew them all up, destroyed them all. This practice of missionary church profiteering in stolen Aboriginal land was not confined to Canada's west coast or to the United Church. All over Western Canada by the early 20th century, Catholic and Protestant churches were granted actual title to Aboriginal lands after they heavily pressured the government to surrender them to them such control. Exhibit 113, for example, is a letter written in March 1888 from Methodist Church Superintendent Alexander Sutherland to the government, claiming that the trouble experienced by the Methodists in their dealings with the Indians was due to the fact that, quote, we have no legal or formal claim to any particular quantity of land, unquote. Sutherland says, the department should give us a title of occupation protecting us alike from complaints of individual Indians and also from trespass either by individuals or by the band. Sutherland also asks for the right to sell the land and its building to purchasers. Exhibit 113. In other words, early on, missionary churches linked their ability to Christianize the savages with their right to own and profit off native land and to bar Indians from their traditional territories as trespassers. Well, the government of Canada granted them this right. As revealed in Exhibit 114, by March 1911, Indian Affairs officials were stating in writing to their church counterparts that, quote, it has been the policy of the department to give a title of occupation to mission and school properties on the reserves. Canada went even further to ensure unimpeded church access to native lands and resources. Exhibit 115 is taken from the Act of Parliament that established the United Church of Canada in 1924. This act granted to that church the powers of a bank and a moneylender and placed the terms of its establishment outside the jurisdiction of every court in Canada. Let me reiterate that. The United Church was given the power of a bank, and it's the terms of its establishment were outside the jurisdiction of any court in Canada. The United Church of Canada Act, as well, took precedence and takes precedence over all other laws in Canada, in that any statutes inconsistent with that act were and are repealed.
To quote the act, ascended to in Parliament on July 19, 1924, quote, The United Church, a body corporate, shall have power to lend money, to borrow money for its purposes, to make and execute bills of exchange, promissory notes, and other negotiable instruments, and shall have the power to collect on a loan and to give and grant any property or interest to another, unquote. Now, as a self-governing financial institution, this state church acted effectively as a land broker in Aboriginal territories, and along with similarly empowered Catholic and Anglican church missionaries, was able to actually seize the lands of indigenous nations under the guise of religion and education, and then sell off and broker that land to other parties. As a result, the vast and lucrative Aboriginal territories of Western Canada were rapidly claimed by churches throughout the 20th century. The Catholic and Protestant churches even acquired remaining reserve land directly from local tribes and drained funds from band council accounts to operate the residential schools built on such lands. Exhibit 116 is part of a lease issued in November 1943 by the federal government to the Oblate Catholic missionaries, whereby the crown handed over to the Catholic Church land of the Muscogee Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Exhibits 117 and 118 are similar surrenders of Indian land or payment of band council money to the Church of England and the United Church of Canada for the operation of Indian schools in the years 1938 and 1948, respectively. Exhibit 119 indicates that $140 from Band Council money of the Sioux Wapaton Indians of Saskatchewan was paid directly to the Presbyterian Church to construct a new church on the reservation. These records indicate that well before the mid-20th century, Indian people in Western Canada had lost all control over not only their own land, but their financial assets, which were placed at the service of the missionary churches. Native families not only paid for the residential school internment camps, where half of their children would die, but they maintained these camps through their own labor and wealth, and from the slave labor of the interned children there. That's why any call for justice has to include the return of that land and assets to the Native nations by all of these churches. Now these words of West Coast Federal Land Commissioner and Missionary Gilbert Sprout in 1868 sum up the attitude and practice of Christian Canadians towards the Indians' right to their own land. Quote, We often talked about our right as strangers to take possession of the district. As the Indians disclaimed any knowledge of the colonial authorities in Victoria, and had sold the country to us under the fear of loaded cannon pointed towards their village, it was evident that we had taken forcible possession of the district. Any right in the soil which these natives had as occupiers was partial and imperfect, since besides plucking wild fruits and cutting a few trees to make canoes and houses, the natives did not in any civilized sense occupy the land. The whole question of the right of any people to intrude upon another and to dispossess them of the country is one of those questions to which the answer is always the same." Unquote. Well, the consequence of this dispossession of Aboriginal land was to rapidly create Indians as a permanent underclass and denationalized and a stateless group of people in their own land. This stateless status was established long before the final occupation of native land by white settlers, through such laws as the Gradual Civilization Act of 1857, which allowed a limited legal recognition of Indians only after they had surrendered their cultural identity and their treaty and land rights. But the depriving of native nations of their land base and traditional economies hastened their impoverishment and their loss of nationhood. Exhibit 120 is a petition to the Indian Affairs Department from six elders of the Stolo Nation near Chilliwack, British Columbia, dated April 26, 1894.
The petition objects to the government's recent denial of the Stolo's right to sell fish and thereby compete with white fishermen, as well as the destruction of their fish supply. And it states, quote, We are also told at certain seasons that we may catch fish for our own use, but not sell them to white people. We think this is very unjust. We would also like to protest against the wholesale slaughter of the sturgeon in the Fraser River. Now the white people are going about to destroy what seems to be our last resort, unquote. The petition also protests the government's policy of suppressing native medicine and healing customs while stopping all medical supplies to them. Quote, we are very sorry that the government has stopped giving medicines to our sick people, whilst at the same time we are told that our own doctors are not to practice. When sickness overtakes us, many of our people die because we cannot pay the white man doctor and we have no medicine to buy, no money to buy medicine, unquote. Now, barely two decades after this letter was sent to Ottawa, the Stolo Nation had been eradicated to barely 1% of its pre-contact numbers. The degree to which these attacks quickly eroded any Aboriginal sense of sovereignty or self-identity is found in the practice of conquered native bands of enforcing laws in their own people, compelling their children into the earliest Indian residential schools. Exhibit 121 is a statement dated May 1891 from five chiefs of the St. Peter's Band of the Clandy Boy Agency in Manitoba, issuing fines against any native parent whose child was absent from the local residential school. The government then used this precedent to pass amendments to the Indian Act compelling such attendance in Indian schools. And this culminated eventually in the federal law of July 1920, requiring that all Indian children in Canada attend residential schools, Exhibit 122. This gradual restriction of Aboriginal movements culminated in laws based in the 1920s that permanently confined Indians to reservations and confined their travel to officially approved outings. Exhibit 123 is a special form required for all Indians in Canada to travel on the railways. Now, under the Indian Act, reservations are still internment camps supervised by the government. This kind of legal restriction of a targeted group's movements is another feature of a genocidal regime once the people have lost title and control over their own land. And this stateless condition still characterizes Aboriginal life in Canada today. Well, we move on now to the fifth and the final definition of genocide presented in our case, and that is the forcible abduction, the moving and the confining of those of one group to another. We're going to demonstrate this by showing evidence that indicates that this was a central purpose of the Canadian Indian residential school system, and therefore occurred systematically within these schools throughout their entire history, not just one part of the history. And the fact that more Aboriginal children today are confined in the homes of non-Aboriginal foster parents or social service agencies than ever attended Indian residential schools, this indicates that this form of cultural extermination is continuing in Canada today. The federal law requiring the forced abduction, transfer, and confinement of Native children into special camps called residential schools was passed in the Parliament of Canada on July 1, 1920. The parliamentary debate that preceded this law is very interesting because it indicates a clear intent by the government to separate Aboriginal children from their group and place them in another group in order to wipe out their cultural memory and sever all ties to their families. In Exhibit 124, from the parliamentary Hansard record of June 8, 1920, Minister of the Interior Arthur Meehan defends the establishment of Indian boarding schools. He states, quote, as regards the day schools in the West, I fear there has not been any great success. 
The chief difficulty has been to get the Indian children to attend with sufficient regularity to make progress. The boarding school is the proper system of Indian education. But the great trouble is that just as soon as the child gets out, his tendency is to revert back to the reserve. And in a short time, the value of his education is largely lost. We must encourage and enable the Indian to be enfranchised and to be out away from the reserve to fight his own way in the world like other people." Unquote. The enfranchisement mentioned and recommended by Arthur Meehan was the legal surrender of Indians of all of their treaty rights, including the right to occupy their ancestral land. This amounted to genocide and was seen by the government as the natural consequence of the attendance of children in Indian residential schools. It's also significant that in the same speech, Arthur Meehan made glowing reference to the File Hills Indian Residential School in Saskatchewan, run by the Catholic Church, where the death rate among students averaged nearly 69%, according to Indian Affairs' Dr. Peter Bryce. Meehan stated, quote, the Fire Hills colony is undoubtedly a phenomenal success, unquote. A success, that is, in killing off Indian children. Additional evidence to support Meehan's claim that Indian day schools were not efficiently confining targeted Indian children is found in Exhibits 125 and 126. Exhibit 125 is an Indian agent's report from the west coast of Vancouver Island in June 1915 regarding the Klaus Day School. It states, quote, Progress in these subjects are slow, owing to the nomadic habits of the people on this reserve. The school is now closed, the Indians having all gone away, unquote. Exhibit 126 is a report by the Methodist Church on the level of attendance in their Indian day schools and residential schools for the year 1924-25. The average in attendance of Native children in day schools is well below 50%, in some cases as low as 10%, but the attendance in their Indian boarding schools is nearly 100%. Once the 1920 federal law made confinement in a residential school mandatory for every Indian child over seven, Indians were not only efficiently imprisoned at a young age, but they were swept into such confinement from very wide geographical areas. Exhibit 127 shows the number of students from different regions of British Columbia held at the Kokolitsa Residential School east of Vancouver, run by the United Church. Some of these children were from many hundreds of miles away, as far north as the Queen Charlotte Islands. It was a normal practice for children much younger than the prescribed age of seven to be seized by RCMP officers, clergy, and others who were deputized to abduct children from their villages. Native parents could be arrested, fined, and sent to jail if they resisted. Now, George Brown was abducted and forcibly incarcerated at age six in the United Church School in Edmonton. In video exhibit 127A, he describes his separation from his family. Well, you never, the only thing you're worried about is uh, how you're going to survive um, at the day. You just, because you had no mother, you had no parents, and <clears throat> you didn't even know where you're at, uh, even though uh, you know you ended up somewhere uh, a couple of days by train, and I had no, dear, uh, no idea where I was at. And, and we got there, like I said, we were all on the same dorm and one floor, double bunks, and uh, there was sexual abuse going on all around with the kids, and I was sexually abused, and, and uh, uh, kids would be uh, screaming throughout the night, uh, kicked right out of their beds, and flying in here, and 
landing screaming. So we live in constant fear and uh, we're always cold and lonely. I didn't look forward to uh, going home because of the fact I knew I was coming back again. So there's quite an amount of stress there that uh, you know the six, seven year old kid, an eight year old kid uh, has to go through. No, you're going to go back to the same environment and uh, the same bullshit as uh, as uh, why I, why are we going back? What did we do wrong? You know, and what did we do to deserve to to be treated like this, like like animals? And Wilf Price of the Haida Nation describes how his own father was forcibly taken into the local residential school in northern British Columbia in Video Exhibit 127B. They were herded into the dump truck. They were brought directly. Uh, they, they were driven directly to the um, loading area down at the main wharf and, and literally kidnapped from uh, Masset on one of these old tramp steamers. And they were, uh, all 14 of them were kept in the, uh, kept in the, uh, the lower, the, the lower uh, part of the boat and they were never allowed out. I mean, they had to pee there, they had to poop there, they had to eat there. I mean, they were, they were just jammed into one little room for five days. Exhibit 128 is from the statement of United Church Alberni school survivor Harriet Nahani, who said, quote, The Mounties made clean sweeps of all the coastal villages, taking all the children to residential school, even the toddlers. The parents would sit on the beaches for days and just sob for their children. And a lot of those kids never came home except in a coffin, unquote. Amendments to the Indian Act in 1930 gave the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and any other person so deputized the right to use, and here's the quote, any force whatsoever to forcibly remove children from Indian villages and confine them there until they were 18 years old. Exhibit 129 is a report dated October 1933 from RCMP Constable W.J. Dernan in Vancouver, describing his issuing a warning to a native man, George Johnson, who had refused to send his children to the Catholic school on the local Squamish reservation. Exhibit 130 is a similar RCMP report issued five years later in April 1938 describing the hunting down and arrest of three Indian boys who ran away from the same residential school in North Vancouver. The local magistrate found the boys guilty of a felony and ordered that they be flogged by their own parents. Now, as we've noted, Indian children who were sick or infected with tuberculosis were regularly admitted into Indian residential schools, as Del Riley describes in a video exhibit 131. When you, when you came in there, what was your condition? Uh, when I originally came in, I, I had just gotten out of the sanatorium, both my sister and I. We were admitted on, into here, and I, I just read her... Uh, her intake uh, admission slip there and said uh, she had TB. Well, I must have had it, uh, well, I had the same that she had because we were in the sanatorium together. My mother died there and then they brought us here. This was common practice at these residential schools where they brought in uh, kids that were diseased. There was no, uh, uh, say, filtration system within the school. Yeah to properly uh, uh, circulate uh, air or anything. So if one kid got sick, they all got sick. Yeah. It is significant that Indian chiefs were paid to transport children from their villages into Indian schools, as we've mentioned before. Exhibit 132 is another receipt of a payment made from the Indian Affairs Department issued to Chief Paul White 
from transporting children to and from the Nanaimo Indian School in December of 1935. Indian band councils had for many years been pressured by the government to incarcerate their own children in Indian schools. Exhibit 133 is a resolution passed by the chiefs of the St. Peter's Band in Clandibor, Saskatchewan in November 1893. It orders that every Cree child six and older attend local Indian schools and provides for the fining of Indian parents if they do not attend. Once Indian children were brought to the incarceration centers called residential schools, they were separated by sexes and were never allowed to see their brothers or sisters or their relatives. Residential schools were all constructed according to the same standard H shape in order to, be, to permanently segregate males from females. Exhibit 134 is a blueprint of the Catholic Christie Indian School in Choir Club, Vancouver Island. You will note the separate sleeping and recreational facilities for girls and boys at opposite ends of the building. Upon entering residential school, all children were immediately dehumanized and regulated by having their heads shaved and being issued a number that was their new identity. The system of classifying and numbering students is shown in Exhibit 135, a standard quarterly return report, in this case from the Catholic School in Kamloops, British Columbia, September 1947. Exhibit 136 shows how students were never referred to by their names, but only by their numbers, in this letter of January 1942 to the Indian Affairs Department concerning the Catholic Cooper Island School. It should be noted that despite this record system, it was common practice never to state the cause of death of Indian children on these forms. Exhibit 137 shows a list of discharged children at the Catholic Seashelt School in January 1938. Student Louis Johnson, number 155, is listed as dead, with no cause of death recorded. And Del Riley tells of the trauma of being incarcerated in the Church of England Residential School in Brantford, Ontario. Video Exhibit 139. And uh, they starved us, beat us, froze us. And uh, it, it was horrific. There was no controls in the place. Kids were always getting beat up or being put through various torture uh, uh, rituals, such as uh, first got here, we had to go through. Uh, uh, they call one of those uh, where everybody beats on you. Uh, just forget what it's called. Running the gauntlet. Gauntlet. Yeah, we had to run the gauntlet. Uh, we we're beaten severely for the most minor infractions. It, 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 they try to instill absolute fear into you. Now we've noted the constantly unhealthy, unsafe on substandard condition in these schools. Exhibit 140 reveals that the highest church authorities knew of dangerous conditions in them and yet deliberately did nothing. This exhibit is a letter from the Indian School Commission of the Church of England dated June 1943. Concerning its St. Michael's Residential School in Alert Bay, British Columbia, it reads, quote, We recognize that this building is a fire trap but consider that unless it is immediately demolished, it is safer to keep it in use." Unquote. Similarly, children were never fed properly, as Exhibits 141 and 142 reveal. 
These are financial statements from the Anglican St. George's School in Lytton, British Columbia, dated August 1946 and August 1947, one year apart. In one year, the money spent on food for the children has been cut by more than 50%, from $1,109 to $514, and fuel for heating the children's dormitories has similarly been slashed by nearly 50%. And yet, the surplus in the school budget remained at $3,688 at the end of that year, showing that a lack of money was not responsible for this deliberate starving of the children. These murderous conditions led to continual escapes and attempted escapes from residential schools by the children. Punishment for escaping was severe. Exhibit 143 is a letter from the principal of the Anglican St. George's Indian School in Lytton, British Columbia, dated June 1942. Referring to his predecessor, he states, quote, Two girls ran away, and they were chained together and driven home in front of the principal. They used the shackles to chain runaways to the bed. They also had stocks in the playgrounds, and they were used." Unquote. Del Riley describes the fate of his brother when he ran away from the Church of England Residential School in Brantford, Ontario, in video exhibit 143A. Uh, a brother of mine was uh... He ran away 15 times from this place, and he was beaten severely every time. Sometimes so badly that uh, it took him over a month to, to heal up. But he still preferred to run away than to try to uh, exist in this uh, hellhole. Other punishments routinely inflicted on children for running away included public floggings, rape, solitary confinement without food or water for days, and random physical tortures. Will Price describes the torture of his father at the United Church Edmonton Residential School in video exhibit 143B. So they brought my father into the barn and uh, they said, okay, uh, uh, do you believe in God and all of this stuff? And he said, uh, no, I, I, I can't. I've got my own religion. And they said, okay, fine. And they stripped him down naked, they sat him on a chair, tied his hands down, tied his feet down, spread his legs apart, and uh, used probably one of the first uh, uh, cattle prods, that uh, electric cattle prods. And there was a lot of electricity going through it because Dad said there was a huge cable at the uh, end of it and they just had a big round thing at the, at the, at the head of it. And he, uh, they, they just touch him with it, and they just barely touched his penis, and his penis immediately flew up into the air, and he he uh, he didn't scream out. He will he would not scream, but he said the the pain literally went through his whole body. The the electric shock went through his whole body, and uh, uh, they, they did this about ten times to him, and he would not give in to them and finally he just passed out from the pain but his his penis and his uh, well his balls were, were uh, his testicles were so swollen and so burned that it took him uh, at least two months to recover and he couldn't walk or well he had to walk he had to go to school every day and he had to do work but it was so painful that uh, he, he, he was unable to do anything, even if he'd wanted to. From that time till, till the minister left, Mr. Snell left, uh, we used to have shock treatments. And um, the senior room teacher, Mr. Yendel, used to put this little girl's hand on a, on a plate or on a on something and uh, she'd get a shock. We'd all join hands 
She'd get a shock and then it would pass from girl to girl, excuse me, all the way around the room. And uh, we did that every, every two, probably every two weeks, around maybe twice a month. It was quite often anyway. It should be noted that these brutalities occurred under the legal auspices of the churches that operated the schools, which had a legal obligation to care for the Indians under their charge. Exhibit 144 is a letter from Indian Affairs Deputy Superintendent Duncan Campbell Scott, dated at the start of the program in November 1920, in which he writes, quote, The management of the institution, which is a Roman Catholic school, rests entirely with the church authorities, who have the privilege of nominating the principal and appointing the other members of the staff. The church authorities are held responsible for feeding and clothing the children. Unquote. Now finally, it must be noted the children who ran away from confinement in these schools and were caught were criminalized by the Canadian judicial system, regardless of their age. Exhibit 145 is an excerpt from the 1956 edition of the Indian Act of Canada and states that any Indian who is absent from the residential school shall be deemed to be a juvenile delinquent under the law. It is undeniable based on all this evidence, that the aim and consequence of forcibly removing Indian children from their communities into residential schools was genocidal and was responsible for systemic suffering and death throughout the entire span of the residential school system between 1889 and 1996, 107 years. Let us conclude with these words by Chippewa Nation Elder Del Riley a venerable political leader and residential school survivor in video exhibit 145A. I would have loved to have seen the, uh, the perpetrators uh, severely punished for all of this. And I would, the, the greatest thing I'd, I would want to see is the uh, Church of England uh, get barred from practicing in Canada. That, to me, would be I would love to see. Now this concludes the main argument of the prosecutor's office concerning evidence of intentional genocide by church and state in Canada. We'll now proceed to the summary of the prosecution's case. May it please the court, we will now summarize the prosecution's argument and case. One, the prosecution has proven beyond any reasonable doubt the existence of a premeditated plan and criminal conspiracy by the defendants and their organizations to depopulate and exterminate non-Christian indigenous populations and their children under the guise of religious education and the so-called Indian residential school system. And these defendants are the Government of Canada and the Crown of England, the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican, Presbyterian, Methodist and United Church of Canada. Two. The crimes described and documented in our case were committed either by the defendants or by agents of the organizations which they represent. These crimes meet the accepted international legal definitions and standards of genocide and crimes against humanity. The defendants are therefore in clear and direct violation of every provision of the United Nations Convention on the Crime of Genocide and of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and they can and must be held personally and corporately responsible for these crimes. 3. This genocidal plan and conspiracy was established by the highest officials of the Crown of England, the Vatican, the Government of Canada and the aforementioned churches as early as the year 1889 and was codified in a contract signed by all of these parties in Ottawa in November 1910. The general target of this conspiracy were the surviving, unassimilated, and non-Christian indigenous nations of Western Canada and their lands and resources. 4. As a result of this plan and conspiracy, at least 50,000 and as many as 100,000 Aboriginal children died or disappeared in the Indian residential school system 
between the years 1889 and 1996 because of a constant mortality rate of between 30% and 60%. The fact that this huge death rate was present at the very inception of the Indian residential school system and continued for at least half a century indicates a clear genocidal and murderous intent by the operating government and churches that ran these schools. Five, not one person and not one official of church or state has ever been charged or brought to trial in Canada for any of these deaths. Six, a primary cause of this massive death rate was a deliberate and continual practice by residential school staff of exposing healthy Indian children to those sick and dying from tuberculosis, smallpox, and other diseases, and then never treating them. This practice was actively tolerated, protected, and even encouraged by the highest officers of church and state in Canada. Seven, the fact that the government and churches of Canada actively facilitated the spread of disease and death among Indian children is indicated by the following irrefutable evidence. A, enormous mortality rates were present from the very start of the residential school system in 1889 and were vastly much greater than and out of proportion to the existing death rates in Aboriginal communities. B. By 1900, the Government of Canada adopted a practice of not hospitalizing or treating Indians suffering from tuberculosis and made no allowance for the treatment of Indians in federal health laws. C. In 1909, government inspectors described a regular practice in every residential school of housing the sick with the healthy and denying the medical treatment and of deliberately sending children contaminated with smallpox and tuberculosis back into their Aboriginal communities. D. Despite this huge death rate of, on average, half the residential school students, in the same period of 1919 to 1920, the federal government abolished all medical inspection of Indian residential schools and made it mandatory under the law for all Native children to be interned in these deadly facilities. E. Between 1928 and 1933, provincial laws were passed allowing the legal, involuntary sterilizations of Indians in those provinces that were most populated with unassimilated Indians, Alberta and British Columbia. F. In the same period, Indians were stripped of the right to hire lawyers or sue in Canadian courts. And G. In 1929, in the midst of this assault on the rights of, and health of Indians, the government transferred legal guardianship power and control over Indian children in residential schools to the clergyman principal and their sponsoring churches. Point number eight. The death and disposal of more than 50,000 Indian children and all of the other crimes committed in these facilities was actively aided and abetted by the Royal Canadian Mount of Police, which was deputized by federal legislation to act as the police arm of the residential school. By every level of government in these churches and by local police, coroners, medical personnel, social workers, and state-funded Aboriginal chiefs. 9. Throughout the entire history of the Indian residential school system, children and adolescents in those schools and Indian hospitals were subjected to standardized, routine, and systematic torture, rape, starvation, beatings, slave labor regimes, medical experimentation, sexual sterilization and forced abortions, child trafficking, and other crimes against humanity committed by clergy, school staff, and others. These crimes occurred under a cloak of official secrecy and legal protection emanating from the highest level of power in Canadian government and church. 10. These crimes have had a devastating intergenerational impact on Indigenous nations across Canada and have allowed the genocidal effects of the residential schools to continue among all of these nations today. 11. At no point in the entire history of the Indian residential school system did the operating churches or the government investigate or try to ameliorate the murderous conditions in these facilities, despite constant complaints by Aboriginal families and solid proof of the enormous death rates therein that existed as early as the year 1891. In fact, the churches continually prevented the closure of these facilities and did everything possible to conceal the crimes committed by their agents in them as they continue to do so today. These facts are further evidence of the deliberate genocidal intent of Canadian church and state. 
12. The Government and Churches of Canada, the Vatican, and the Crown of England, who are the defendants in this case, have actively obstructed justice and a genuine inquiry into their crimes in the residential schools, including by falsifying and destroying evidence, disinterring and destroying the remains of their victims, silencing whistleblowers and eyewitnesses, defrauding the public and the court system, and engaging in an ongoing criminal conspiracy to aid and abet these crimes. On the basis of these facts, the named defendants are consequently guilty on both counts of the indictment of planning and committing genocide in crimes against humanity and of planning and engaging in an ongoing criminal conspiracy. They must be found guilty and receive the most severe sentencing. Therefore, it is the position of the prosecutor's office of this court that the following sentence should be imposed on the defendants and their organizations. Upon summary conviction, the named defendants must be immediately detained and incarcerated for a period of not less than 25 years without the possibility of parole. The personal assets and property of the defendants must be seized as part of the reparations owed by them to their victims and the people of Canada. As criminal bodies, the named organizations represented by the defendants must be legally and actively disestablished, and their entire wealth property, investments, and assets, real and otherwise, must be seized, along with their archives, their records, and other evidence related to these crimes. These guilty criminal bodies that must be disestablished are the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican, the Crown of England and the City of London and its Privy Council Office, the Church of England, the Government of Canada and the Prime Minister's Office, the Royal Canadian Mount of Police, the Anglican Church of Canada, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, and the United Church of Canada. As well, this court and others must immediately commence further proceedings against the accomplices of the defendants and others engaged in these and related crimes that are ongoing, including by launching a massive forensic investigation of the dozens of documented mass graves of children near former Indian residential schools and hospitals across Canada. And finally, this court must declare an immediate public banning of these persons, their accomplices, and their organizations in our communities, and the citizenry must actively enforce this banishment by having no association, legally or financially, with the guilty parties, their accomplices, and their organizations. On behalf of this office, we thank the indulgence of the court and its citizen jurors, and we trust in a verdict by the jury that will allow the living and the dead to finally be given justice by uprooting the institutional source of these crimes. I thank you, and the prosecution rests. This is where, late one night, there were three little ones, tiny little ones that were brought in by their mother. They were left here. And they cried so much that the nun took them and put them in this room. These little ones were, were, were brought in there. And we heard them cry for a long time. All of a sudden, you would hear, like that, you know? And we never heard them after that. And we never saw them the next day. We don't know. We don't know. We asked what happened to them. Nobody knows what happened to those three little ones. But I was in that room in there. We can't open it. We can't go in there. And my friend who passed on, Willie Bass, he uh, grew up in Saskatchewan. And um, I had visited him on a, a number of occasions. He was reflecting uh, to me of his life starting from a residential school where he was punished in a residential school uh, where he had 60 lashes on his back from a strap. And he said, you, um, you're probably wondering how I know that, George. He said, because uh, the kids had to count out the lashes on his back. And he said, you thought that was bad. He said, my buddy got it 300 times. And he said, uh, the only reason why the sister had quit he said it's because she was too tired. She couldn't wail anymore. And two weeks later, that young boy died. A lot of little graves behind uh, 
the shed or the big shed there, unborn babies or babies. The, the girls on the girl side, some of them would be get pregnant and they'd have the babies and they'd, the babies would be snuffed out and buried there. 